Minister, I thank you very much, Janab Ahmed Hussain. I welcome you to the mm-hmm. WR 770 Sazova's platform. Thank you very much being here with us. Thank you. I feel very welcome and uh, I'm very happy to be here. We haven't done anything yet. Uh-huh. Uh, we haven't done anything yet and you're No, because welcome. I, I know the host. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We, we met uh, many times, and I always uh, feel uh, comfortable talking to her. And thank you. And At thank this you. point of time, I would like to say thanks to our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. I remember when Ahmed Hussein came; it was the time when uh, Donald Trump said something about the Muslims, and uh, uh, our Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau he uh, took a Stood very yep. strong point, and he brought in our uh, uh, Immigration Minister a Muslim who paid the price in the beginning and uh, he s- he he uh, settled himself he proved himself and then today he is our uh, immigration minister sir thank you again uh, being giving importance to our listeners and to all the muslims uh, would you please tell us when you were appointed uh, what was that time and uh, and i appreciate our prime minister justin trudeau a lot for that well, uh, when I got appointed, uh, as you said, uh, this is something that has been happening for a while. The, it's not just the United States, but a, a number of countries have been viewing immigration uh, as something to be controlled, as something to be afraid of, as something to tighten and close doors uh, to people, to, Im- to skills, to students, to family reunification. And we know in Canada that uh, immigration has been a great strength for this country. Um, forget about even it being the right thing to do in terms of our moral obligations. Mm-hmm. Economically, the case for immigration is settled. Economically. In this country, in 1972, we had uh, six working Canadians for each retiree. Okay. Mm-hmm. By 2012, that ratio had gone down to four working Canadians to each retiree. If we don't do, if we don't continue to be ambitious in immigration, and if we don't welcome more um, immigrants mm-hmm. by 2036, that ratio will drop to two working Canadians to support one retiree. Now, let me ask you: How are we going to support our much cherished social programs like the healthcare? Mm-hmm. and pension plan, the Canadian pension plan and other things, our infrastructure, our transit, uh, without bringing in more people. people who are working. So the difference, one of the ways to address that gap is through immigration. Second thing is, if you look at regionally, sometimes you see that the, the case, you don't even have to wait for 2036. So Newfoundland, for example, for every 100 adults who join the workforce, 125 retire from it. Wow. Now, how is Newfoundland going to maintain its competitiveness, its ability to simply pay for services, to maintain a tax base, let alone grow? So immigration is, the case for immigration economically has already been made. Let no one argue with you on that. Mm -hmm. You can just give them those numbers and say, look, we need immigrants. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and more importantly, imagine having a country where you have an open immigration policy that allows you to take advantage of Canadian Canadian uh, generosity and the welcoming nature of Canadians that makes a huge difference people want to come here now they can get the same services sometimes in the United States or the UK but they say you know what I'll choose Canada why because subjectively I feel welcome some of the people that we're attracting now the skilled uh, immigrants who are coming here to create jobs, they can go into the United States. They haven't been affected by, t- by, by the executive orders. But they're saying, even though I'm not affected, even though I have access to the U.S., subjectively, I'm, I don't feel that the environment is welcoming. So you know what? I'll pick Canada. Mm-hmm. It's a huge economic and competitive advantage. And in the world today, believe me, there is a race for talent. Mm. Every country is, is, is gr- trying to grab that mobile talent. And that talent can go anywhere. They don't have to come to Canada. They don't have to come to the United States. Denmark, Australia, New Zealand, new players, old players, everyone is in this game. So the immigration policies that you have plus the welcoming society that you have, the 
the only reason we're able to continue to be ambitious on immigration and continuing to use immigration to power our economy is because of Canadians' uh, welcoming nature. I if that didn't true. exist, we wouldn't be able to do half of the things we've been able to do. I can tell you that from a personal experience. I wouldn't be where I am today without the generosity of Canadians. And I think a lot of newcomers know that, mm-hmm. but we don't hear that enough, and we should say that openly. Secondly, our priorities, as, as you said, in a world where this is the, the new no- global context, we've taken the opposite approach and we'll never ap- apologize for that, which is we will welcome students, we will welcome uh, skilled people, we will, we will reunite families, we will not keep families apart, and yes, we will always have room in our immigration system for refugees because that's part of who we are. We have to fulfill our international obligations, but it's also the right thing to do. You know, when you say no to refugees and you say, I just want economic immigrants, you lose a part of your soul as a country. Refugees make a contribution as well. Refugees are not monolithic. Refugees are people like you and me who had a difficult circumstance and had to flee. So they bring different experiences. So tomorrow, if you're a refugee, you will bring your experience of being a journalist to the table. I'll bring my, my experience of being a lawyer to the table. So we're not monolithic in that sense, and we have to also recognize the contributions that refugees make. Um, f- uh, finally, before I, 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 I kick it back to you, I'm very proud of our Prime Minister. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has stood at the United, Na- uh, the United Nations, at the White House, in Ottawa, in Europe, and he has said, Canada, although we're not perfect, although we're still grappling with how to uh, deliver on reconciliation with indigenous peoples, how to dismantle systemic racism and so on, how to fight Islamophobia. Uh, but he, he's, he has said very clearly that we will double down on our settlement and integration model, we'll continue to welcome immigrants because that's the right thing to do. And by the way, he's the first prime minister who uh, went... Um, who made a speech at an Eid celebration where he said, I call on all Canadians to combat Islamophobia. I've never heard a Prime Minister talk like that. He's the one who talks about a, 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 you know, a nation-to-nation relationship, to fix the broken relationship between Canadians and Indigenous people. He's the first sitting Prime Minister in Canadian history to use the word systemic racism. Mm-hmm. So wh- what we're dealing with is exceptional uh, leadership, and I'm proud to be part of that team, and I think um, you were talking about which party to support and so on. At the end of the day, uh, what matters is not just the programs and the money that we invest, even though that's really a huge part of it, but also which values we project. Mm-hmm. I'm proud of our Prime Minister when he stands at the United Nations and speaks about not only Canada's success, but our, our, our failures. And he, he, and he shares with the world and he says, he, he, he exposes our vulnerabilities and says, we are not perfect, we're, we have these problems and we're working mm-hmm. on them and if you have solutions, please share. And, he, and in, it's in that same vein that he was very strong in defending the rights of the Rohingya people in Myanmar. And he engaged with Myanmar to say, look, we're not perfect, but what you're doing is wrong. And if you need help, we can work with you. But stop. Stop uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And Canada will not uh, be quiet. Canada will move and and uh, respond by providing aid, um, uh, medicine, food, water to the people in Bangladesh who have fled Myanmar. But he engaged directly with Aung San Suu Kyi and the military. You can read his public paper to, uh, letter to Aung San Suu Kyi. It's the harshest letter I've ever seen a prime minister write to, to another leader of another country. But that's, that's Canadian values for me. At the end of the day, our Prime Minister, the leader, of course, uh, and uh, Ajipay, I would like to say, yes, whatever Mr. Ahmed Hussain, our immigration, honorable immigration minister said, it is, of course, it carries weight, uh, because uh, I remember uh, indigenous people. Mm-hmm. Now, I think since I came to Canada, this term is the first time I heard about, because he is uncovering the problems what they were f- is facing mm-hmm. uh, the murders uh, deaths of the indigenous uh, women uh, there was uh, uh, something else the water, water 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 poisoning 
you know, boil water access, to, access to clean water, yeah. access to clean water. Education. So it, it was of control of it. And, you know, the, the, the main thing is, you know, since ever Canada came into indigenous people, like they were given that kind of water and uh, access to clean water was not available for them. And this is this prime minister uh, gave them the, the, the access to that. And he he uncovered that problem. Hmm. So. Uh, it takes a man to face all these things and say, well, yes, we have a problem. Let's solve it. Exactly. I just want to say very, very quickly on immigration. What have we done? We've delivered. We promised to double the number of parents and grandparents. We've delivered on that. We promised that one of the first things we'll tackle, uh, because we couldn't tackle everything at once in the beginning, is to fix the spousal sponsorship delays. We inherited a system where 26 months or more, it used to take 26 months or more to sponsor a spouse. It now takes 12 months. And this is across the board, not only for, uh, for, 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 for other parts, of, but not only uh, for Europeans and Africans and South Americans, but also in South Asia and, and, and East Asia. Uh, all spousal sponsorships now take, the vast majority take less than 12 months. That's huge progress. Citizenship, it used to take 24 months, it now takes 12 months. Something as simple as re renewing your PR card used to take 8 to 10 months, it now takes 52 days. BLC 6, removing the obstacles towards citizenship. You know, why would we make it harder for people to become citizens if they've if they've stayed in Canada and they're making contrib a contribution and they have a good track record? We should m encourage them to become citizens. So Bill C six has restored that balance again, uh, and specific uh, to to India Pakistan. Those two countries are important for us as source countries for permanent immigrants, but also for international students. Specifically for India, we've been dealing with huge volume increases and we've introduced efficiencies to and, and improvements to deal with that. In terms of Pakistan, I know that uh, the temporary resident visa applications were moved to Abu Dhabi and the spousal applications were moved to London, UK. I've visited both visa offices with a specific focus on the Pakistani cases and I can tell you I was impressed by the work that London visa office is doing for the Pakistani spousal cases they are triaging the cases 80 to 90 percent of the obvious ones that you know there's a clear relationship it's there's no fraud they they fast track it so it's actually taking less than 12 months there's a few that are complex you know fraud security whatever but vast majority are being fast tracked they have a really good system I saw it for myself I went through the cases myself I went to the belly of the beast, so this is not some talking point. This is personal experience. Abu Dhabi, same thing. TRV, we're working with them to improve the, the, the processing times. And um, uh, shortly, I will be embarking on a visit to South Asia. And, uh, the details are not finalized, but I will be... Uh, considering uh, doing India and Pakistan. Uh, either Thank together. you very so kindly, to Minister. Make sure that we continue to uh, increase that potential for people-to-people -people relationship and a deeper uh, trade relationship with Pakistan. My colleague, Minister uh, Francois-Philippe Champagne, and I have, uh, have had um, conversations about this. The community uh, engaged me to say, look, there's a lot of trading opportunities with respect to Canada, Pakistan. I relayed those feed that feedback to my colleague, Minister. He's very interested. On Monday, him and I um, and the Pakistani High Commissioner in Ottawa are meeting the uh, Foreign Minister from Pakistan for lunch, and we will be discussing this. Thank you very much. He answered something which I was about to ask, and uh, uh, of course, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and you knew that I'm going to, and I always say the same thing. Uh, India is a great economy at the moment. The whole world is looking towards India, and our uh, uh, our uh, government travel uh, tremendous time to India. Pakistan, I feel, is being deprived many times. Pakistan we have does hidden, have hidden talent, gems. We have exactly hidden gems, exactly. which we haven't uh, showed it to people, but. Once all the Canadians That's and the high time. officials used to go, is going to go there, they'll find that hey, this is a great opportunity there. Exactly, and uh, Minister, yes, uh, being representative of Pakistan, I would say, uh, and I feel my country is being deprived. And I appreciate living in Canada. Definitely, we as a Canadian should grab any opportunity in the world. And India is, of course, is the greatest mm -hmm. economy at the moment, and uh, it's a benefit of but Canada. Can I, can but I respond to that? I think that. It's fair to say that what you just said is true. 
But I also think that sometimes uh, the media doesn't pick up on concrete steps that have been taken to address that. So, for example, I met with the Pakistani High Commission a number of times uh, the, to specifically talk about increasing the number of international students from Pakistan to Canada. And we're putting together a strategy to do that. I'm, I just told you that I'm visiting. I visited the two visa offices specifically to deal with Pakistani cases. So I would also like the media... Yes, to talk to about the, the, the pressure points, <laughs> but to also talk about the progress. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> there's no journalistic balance. No, right? yeah, no, no. Anyway, we do. I thank I you myself. very kindly. <laughs> I love you, my dear brother, and I respect you as my honorable minister. And of course, you have taken very concrete points. Of course, I'll keep on saying again and again, do not leave Pakistan alone. Uh, Pakistan has talent. And I remember I would like to mention name again today. Uh, the Telenor company in Pakistan is being represented by one of the Canadian, 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 born, raised, studied here in, and he specially traveled to Canada just to let uh, our uh, Mike honorable Foley. Uh, Mike F uh, Foley. And uh, I remember our previous uh, immigration uh, John McCallum was there and yes. he said I am here specially just to say that Pakistan has talent being Canadian That's I am uh, operating my business there it's a wonderful country yes. and I request I uh, you go there and of course bring our talent and come to know I thank you very kindly and, and um, thank uh, you. minister thank you very kindly to uh, talk to and come to uh, here at the studio to speak with our listeners and above all I thank Zubair Patel I love Absolutely. you my dear son I love you and Minister, thank you very kindly.